questionnaire as well. It's, uh, you just go. I've never heard of a review board or anything. <laughs> Has anyone heard of a review board yes. for their country? Yeah. Yes, okay, so some countries have it, some don't. No, um, you just go as the barrier, and, uh, I mean, you just go with your questionnaires. And, <laughs> and that's fine, and really, as long as you're surveying adults and not, you know, at-risk populations, at our school there's something called an exemption category, and so you're asking for permission under the exemption category. But as soon as you're asking, you know, things um, that could cause someone to lose their job, mm -hmm. or it's a population that would be for would feel forced to answer, like students in your class or prisoners at a prison, uh, you know, at, at risk populations, then you have to ask for permission um, more thoroughly, and a board of people review your questions and review how you're recruiting people. Same for children, so if you're doing any kind of education research, um, you have to go through this process. Um, they, but just keep in mind, you know, if you don't have a review board... Maybe it's there, but I have to find out. Yeah, it's a good thing to find out. Um, and just to keep in the back of the mind, am I asking any questions that may put the person in a weird spot or, you know, that are really personal information and then I have to be really careful how I store the data, maybe in locked file cabinets and don't, you know, distribute it. Um, just, it's common sense for the most part. Um, but if you don't have uh, scruples, then yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just want to add, maybe they don't call it review board. Normally they call it ethical theorems. So what? Sorry? Ethical theorems. So <laughs> apparently in some places they call it ethical clearance, not review ah, board. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because in our case it's just you go in the field and then you ask, what do you use this for? That's the type of no, but so when you present your proposal, don't they check your questionnaire? No, this is not like a proposal, but it's part of a day-to-day -day yeah, way of documenting what plants are used for. So, uh, sorry? The institution most likely has one. Like for us, we, I come from a research institute, so we do not necessarily need to review your research on a daily basis. We review them once a year. Mm. for all this thematic. So for that year, as many times as you go into the field, mm. it's already been cleared. Yeah, you do it once per questionnaire, um, but usually, yes, yeah, someone looks over your question, an independent person looks over your questions. Okay. It, and it only applies if you intend to publish the results yeah. in a newspaper or in a, um, a journal. But if you're making the, re the results public, even in their aggregate, then yes. typically you are asked to get the, get the question and the protocol reviewed. Oh. Thank you. No, thank you for the question. Um, again, you know, you have to think about the goal of the survey. Do not add questions because they're just interesting. You really have to think, does this question help me answer my research question? Okay, so just a little quick, well first you have questions for me. Open-ended or close-ended questions? Sorry? A dumb survey joke. <laughs> uh, Jesse. Oh yeah. <laughs> I've just noticed that as for your case, mailing people works. For us, we have to do most of the time face-to-face -face surveys because yeah. mailing people addresses are a limit to towns and a few things like that. But then in our rural spaces, we have to move around. So any recommendations for like interviewing techniques, etiquette or something like that? So interview... <laughs> okay, so first of all, so the first survey I ever did, uh, we didn't have ad, well, we, we didn't have good enough addresses that we trusted. And so for the multiple contacts, what we did was we actually went to the person, 
um, knocked on their door, dropped off their survey, talked to them, and then we did pick, we said, in three days, I'm coming back to pick up this survey. Or we can fill it out together now. But then, you know, we, we, we said, in three days, we're coming back. And then in three days, we were back. If the person was there, we would ask for the survey. If they still hadn't completed, we said, in three days, we're going to be back again. If they weren't home, we had a post-it note glued on the door, you know, scotch tape, basically, that, that gave the exact same information. Like, we stopped by. Your survey isn't on your door. Like, we gave you the plastic bag to hang it. Please, um please uh, complete it and post it on your door by this date, by this time, and we'll come and pick it up. And using that, so no addresses really, um, we got a 53% response rate in just three contacts. So, you know, if we had had more contacts, but we ran out of gas money, basically. Um, but if, if we had had more contacts, I think we would have had a comparable response rate than a mail, um, the mail drop-off uh, method I, I, I uh, described. Now, interviews you can do you can do a questionnaire like the one I pass around with someone just read it and ask them to or you fill it out um, with them typically interviews though will be more open-ended questions and you will uh, take notes but you will also record um, with a, and you try and be you know hopefully in a room that doesn't have that much background noise or something so that the quality of the recording is high if possible. Um, and then those are transcribed. Um, so those are transcribed and then you highlight themes that emerge from that. But that is horribly time consuming. Um, it's, it's, and so usually you have a much lower response rate. Like we have, you know, 200 surveys. Um, the interviews like uh, my students have done, you know, they'll get 30, although I've seen people with, with 70 to 100, but that's much more time consuming, uh, like I said. Um, but, but it is pretty neat. You get much more richer information because people can qualify the answers. And so, so it's a trade-off and it really depends what your research um, question is, what your population is. Like if people can't read or you can't, you know, I mean, like, yeah. Yeah, I was going to build on that one. So, I mean, usually in some of the rural context, people cannot read. Cannot read. Yeah, so yes. you can never rely on that one. Yeah. So one way to go around it is to have some uh, drawings. So if you're talking about, I don't know, we just recently did an exercise where we wanted to ask how much time they spend collecting firewood compared with um, hunting and collecting other non-timber forest products. So you could have like a drawing of a firewood, of a fish and whatever, mm. and that helps them think as well. So think that they cannot read, but they can see. I mean, you can use photos, you can use drawings, you can use maps, so yes. that is helpful. And what I wanted to say, Jesse, is that when you work with um, the local communities, you may, especially in Africa, you may need a translator. Even yes. if you are from yeah, Kenya, you need a certain translator because there are 62 languages in mm -hmm. Kenya, and even if Jesse is very smart, he might speak only five of them. Mm -hmm. So think about your translator and think to take the time to explain very well the survey to your translator because he's key to make to get the right information. Mm -hmm. So make sure you make you spend some time before doing the survey with him or her that he understands what you need to ask. Mm -hmm. So you just record the answers. I mean, as they the cannot write and read themselves. And the second one that I wanted to add on is that try the survey. Try it with maybe five people first and see what you get. Look at the results. Because sometimes the problem is that they don't understand the question. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the problem with the closed end question is just because people are they're not used to surveys. So when you ask them, how, how much do you like your food? <coughs> Zero is none and five is good. Maybe you need to take the time to explain because they're not used to having numbers in their everyday life. What is zero and what is five? Mm -hmm. That five means super nice and zero means no, you really didn't like it. So think about that as well when you design your survey. And not everybody went to school and mm -hmm. understand things in the way that we do, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and like I said, like you want to pilot your survey and you want to pre-test it with your population before you roll out a whole yeah. thing. Because otherwise you will encounter problems that will invalidate all the hard work you're doing and that will make sure, like if you don't do those things, you're probably not going to be able to publish. There are things that you will not have thought about.
But even if you publish, your data might not be good. So somebody can go back to it. So it's very important that you really get the right picture of what's going on for these communities. And now we are going to make a decision about how much firewood they can harvest. So it, I think it's not just about publishing. Even if you don't publish, it's very important they understood the question, so the information you get is correct. So take some time to try the survey, sit down with your translator and look at the results, maybe for 10 questionnaires, what are the trends? If everybody, if you have a rainfall station that says the rainfall has reduced, and everybody in your survey is answering the no, it's increased. Mm. Maybe they didn't understand the question, or maybe the translator didn't use the right word. So spend some time to look at your preliminary survey, not just test it, but look at the findings to make sure that things seem to make sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, very important. Okay, other questions? Uh, maybe just to yeah. share with you an experience yes. on how to get much responses from the respondents. Of course, the issue of postal mail doesn't work in, in Tanzania. That one has long way died. Anyways, uh, we normally use this kind of trick. You have to pay the interviewee. Yeah. And if you don't do that, trust me, the, the responses won't be that much good. So if you want to do a research in Tanzania and you want to interview especially the villagers, Please get with you some few coins as a, a token, yeah, incentives. And I think most of them are used to that. If you interview them and then you live, with, you live without leaving anything to them, trust me, when next time you go back, they won't like, <laughs> they won't like uh, accept you there. Yeah, I just right. share that. No, that, that's great insight. There are cultural differences. In the U.S., like if a survey is going to take someone more than 15 minutes, you're probably going to have to pay them too, okay? Um, or if you have to, like, I have friends that do, you know, that are in physiology labs and they bring people in for, like, do things on exercise machines and stuff. All those people are paid. Um, so it really depends, again, on, and, and you would write that into your, your proposal, right? I need X amount of money to print my survey and I need X amount of money for my incentives based on the size of my population. So you, you would have to factor all those costs into um, your <coughs> research proposal. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so just quickly, um, how would you fix question number one? So you can check with your neighbor for like 30 seconds and be like, um, What's wrong, or you can think about what's wrong with question one, or how would you ask that question, or? <laughs> so what's the problem with question one? It is a leading question, and it is also asking for personal information and very fixed. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's double barreled as well. It's really asking uh, two things. Um, and what about the answers? Yeah, like you just don't have enough answer choices either. Um, once you once you've separated out the questions, you might you know you might uh, need to allow people some qualifiers. Um, what about question number two? What's its main problem? And these are all examples that I've received eventually. It Come on. Yeah? It seems the respondent already does. Right, it should have a preceding question. Do you drink beer, right? And if yes, um, okay, what else? I'm trying to ask myself, what, what if the study is about the impact of alcohol? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Well, it could be, right? And you might need more questions if that's the case, but... Okay, what, what other problems? Uh, it says check the word. So I can check B and C, you know, because uh, the type or maybe the style of answering that question might be check one box or... Yeah, you have to specify... Yeah, 
please yeah, check the way it out. Can check all of them. What about yeah? That's a good uh, observation. What about the uh, balance? He doesn't have a neutral. Exactly right and. For what, what I would say as frequent beer drinking is going to be very different from what my husband thinks is frequent beer drinking, okay? And so you really would have to define more clear, like, do I have one beer a week, three beers a week? That's much more clear. Fifteen a day, like, who knows, right? Um, but... But, uh, but again, this, this question is just not specific enough, it's not clear enough, lots of problems. What about these? These seem pretty innocuous. What's the problem with these? The first one may be a bit too personal, right? Like women in particular may be not like to share their age. So how else might you ask that? Oh, okay, I well, was supposed to answer the second one. Like, how would you, maybe someone doesn't know the difference between a city and a town. What are they going to... Yeah, yeah, but, but what else? Your city or town. For the first two one, you can just have a scale. Uh, just say, if you are only interviewing people from the age of 20, you just start from 20. You say between 20 and 30, 30 and 40, or 35 and 45. So a person doesn't have to write like I am 30 years old, you just... Fantastic, right? So, so you'd give like age bracket ranges and they would pick one and it would be m m less invasive um, than, than asking it like that. So what about the second question? Your city or town? No joke, this is something that I've seen, okay? We don't know it doesn't specify what is happening with this. Exactly. Like, is it where I was born? Is it where I live now? Is it where I lived most of my life? Those, for me, those would be three different cities on different continents. Okay? So, obviously, you know, you need to say, you know, where were you born? What city were you born? And you would also need to ask the state and the country or just the country. I would like to ask you, will be these questions? I'm sorry. Will these questions be answered by writing or by replying uh, verbally? It could be, well, these were meant to be on a questionnaire. Um, so it would be by writing. So either there'd be an answer box or choices that you, um, gosh, that you, um, uh, you, 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 do you know the reasons why I ask these questions? Because when it is an interview, yeah, it's way easier. You, you reformulate the question. But when it is by writing, the question might be more specific and clear. Like, uh, like uh, she said, you may not ask some. How are you? Most of the, the respondents will, will jump these questions. Oh, absolutely. But but this this lecture was about questionnaires, not interviews. So I, I am assuming that these are written down or in an email or in a mail survey. Um, yeah. Uh, what about this one? How would you fix this one? How satisfied were you with the service you received when you bought your AC? Completely satisfied, mostly satisfied, somewhat satisfied, neither satisfied. It has two major issues. The abbreviation of the AC. Fantastic. You don't want to abbreviate AC. Some people will not know. That stands for air conditioner. Uh, and what else? Remember to look at the answers as well. Exactly. It's not balanced, right? Remember that people tend to gravitate to the center. They don't want to be the extremes. That would make me weird, right? And so they tend to pick the middle or ish. Like people usually don't have, you know, um, 
the extreme choices, which is one of the reasons why sometimes you want a seven point Likert, skirt, Likert scale. But, but if so, if you have an unbalanced um, response set, you're guaranteeing that you will have a more, in this case, positive um, uh, mean um, of people that, you know, that, that like their service. And so you're biasing your, your responses. Um, and in this case, you know, that's probably good for this AC company, uh, but it's not good science. Okay, to what extent do you agree with this statement? It's easier for people to find work in this community than it was about a year ago. Well, actually, I meant to, it's the same. Well, this one doesn't have a neutral, okay? Um, so, and I think this is the last, oh no, I have two more. Uh, from which of these sources did you first learn about the tornado in Derby? And Radio, TV, someone at work, while at home, while traveling to work. Multiple problems with this question. <coughs> so who wants to take a stab? Actually, Mr. Respondent, if I don't know, uh, if I don't, I didn't use any of the above, maybe he should include uh, something like others. Yeah. Other? Or, hey, Others both. Specify. Yeah. Exactly. Others specify because you're not going to think about all the choices. So it'd be <laughs> good to know. Um, also, it'd be good to know, you know, a preceding question. Did you even hear about this tornado? Because if not, and you're making this question mandatory, you get nonsense results. What else? What are the other, pro an, another big problem about this question and answer set? So the, anybody? The question is about the source. What are these answers about? Location. The location. So if you want to know the location, that needs to be a separate question with these here. And the source needs to be, you know, another question. Um, plus, you should also probably put, you know, check all that apply or ask when did you where did you first learn or you know from which of these sources did you first learn because anyways um here's one it's related to the first one how would you fix that one it's it's, yeah, you need ranges of income. People are not going to answer that, or few people will answer that. You also need to specify, um, you know, is it household income? Is it primary, um, how do you say, uh, primary breadwinner income? Um, does it, is it income, in the U.S. it would be, is it your income solely from your job or income from, you know, rents or stocks? So you have to, you have to really be much more specific in the question and you have to give people choices of boxes um, in order for them to take, um, to, to have a better chance of people to, to answer your question. Um, so we won't do the other exercise. It was to take this survey, that's a survey I got sent through Ecolog recently, and it has lots of problems. Um, so I, it's, it's about, they're trying to assess um, the perception of ecosystem services coming from urban ponds, and their goal is only to do it in uh, Europe, but I was able to take the survey in the US. I was able to take the survey with an IP address from Rwanda. So already, you know, unless they're asked, and at some point they do ask me where I am, but I'm still taking the survey um, and I'm not in the, same, in the right spot. They also start with the socioeconomic data, which you have to put at the end. You want people to have buy-in into your survey, be interested in your questions, and then you ask them the personal information. They um, also, 
their questions, so they have it in like 20 different languages, but the person who did the English translation must not have been a native speaker. So they have weird turns of phrases that will not make sense to an English speaker. Um, and they also had, it's, it's too long. Um, it's, it, when I tried to print it so that you all would take it um, on paper, it was 40 pages. It's got tons of pictures, which is neat, um, but, but it's way too long. Like for, for a voluntary survey, uh, it's just, it's not going to fly um, with most people, unless they're scientists and you know, they're interested in urban ponds. Um, they did do some things well. They had neat little pictures and, and their, their questions and answers. You know, they used a five point Likert scale mostly. Um, so, so it's not all wrong, but I just wanted to show you it's easy to make a survey that's just not going to answer your question if you're not careful. Now most of what I told you today is from this book. And this is the survey Bible. I am not, that's what people call it. It's called Internet, Phone, Mail, and Mixed Mode Surveys, The Tailored Design Method by Don Dillman, Smith, and Christian. Um, this is the latest edition. There are previous editions, and if you get a, ha uh, a hold of one of those, they're equally as good. This one's just more, um, they have more data supporting. So what he does in his lab, Don Dillman does, is he actually studies response rates, and he studies, like, they'll, they'll change little things, just like how the survey was folded and send it, and they look at, is the response rate statistically significantly different? His whole study, uh, um, you know, body of, of, of study is about um, surveys and response rates and et cetera. And so the book's this thick, but it's excellent. It has examples of how you should word those letters you send and how you should word the postcards and when you should send stuff. And they're all backed up by research. However, it's not a cheap book, um, so I put, he, he um, edited a, a book a, a couple years back with other scientists that has less information but quite a bit of information and it's available as PDF. So I posted it in the readings I gave you the first day and you have a link to where to download this PDF um, once you get the PowerPoint and it's a pretty good it's not as good, but it's a pretty good um, handbook for designing surveys. Um, so I just wanted you to have something to go on. And then again, remember, this is what we're trying to avoid. Um, I don't know if you can read it in the back, but it's like, those polls you took for our political opponents are killing us. Sorry about that, mate. Could you retake them for us just to make sure they're true? Why, of course, what would you like the results to be? He's like, I knew it, right? So we want, we want in, in science, we want survey answers we can trust and we don't want biased um, questions to start with. And hopefully I gave you some of the basic tools to develop reliable surveys. And if you have any questions, fire away. Otherwise I'm done. Yeah. No. Thank you, but really.